Well, I think in the first place uh, they should be much more realistic as to what they can achieve. They should be uh, also aware that you cannot uh, bring about democracy in other countries just on the basis of uh, financial incentives. For too long uh, we have always believed that uh, official development assistance, that aid, would incentivize uh, different types of uh, uh, regimes, different types of uh, governments to reform. Uh, but now we know much better. We know that this is sometimes accepted, this ODA, but that the reforms are just uh, uh, formal facade type of reforms and that there is no real fundamental reform towards democracy. In other cases, uh, countries were definitely not interested in receiving aid because they, they were having a, a wealth of uh, resources which uh, uh, did not incentivize them to, to get more additional resources from the European Union. So we have to look for other types of incentives and this will require quite some, some search. We need to look as to what can incentivize governments that are relatively unwilling to bring about reforms. And then I'm thinking of uh, all types of diplomatic efforts, uh, maybe also trade-related matters, issues that relate to mobility of uh, people from developing countries to the European Union. Maybe these are other incentives that we should play uh, much more in our relationship with uh, uh, the partner countries in the South. Well, the biggest problem that the European Union is encountering is inconsistency. The fact that uh, uh, we speak uh, not the same language and not only thinking of, of the, the European Union, we have already difficulties sometimes between the European institutions and between uh, the Commission and the newly created European External Action Service. It's not always easy to clearly identify the, the role division between these institutions. But at the same time you have of course the individual member states who all pursue their own policies. And uh, the policy of the UK m might be very different from the policy of, of France, for example, in Africa. And Africans, they see this. They see this inconsistency. They are also quite allergic sometimes to the normative, uh, a bit patronizing type of approach that the European Union is adopting. And this is something that I hope will gradually change. And I, I think there are signs that it is changing, that we are getting into a much more equal uh, type of uh, uh, partnership, uh, also because of the pressure that Europe feels of all these new emerging economies, which uh, of course also want to get uh, a role in, in the African uh, scene. And so Europe is probably adapting also a bit uh, more its style and its way of dealing with uh, developing countries, particularly in Africa. Yeah. I think anything that can be done to move beyond the formal type of um, institutions and the formal features of democracy can be helpful to support uh, processes on the ground. So we should be much more investing in understanding how the strings of power, uh, political power and economic power are in many countries uh, held by, by patronage type of systems. We should try to identify the actors and the drivers of change. Uh, and these are not necessarily the ones who are in the formal institutions, as we've seen with the Arab Spring uh, Revolution. There are sometimes dissidents, there are sometimes internet uh, people, there are people who are not always well organized, but who have a, a major mobilization force. And this is the big challenge of uh, this political economy analysis, to really identify the actors, the drivers of change, and to understand much better the context of these societies. And once you have done this, once you have done that homework, you can definitely better apply your lessons because we have plenty of lessons of all these evaluations, excellent lessons, so let's try to apply these.